Part 2, Chapter 6, Permission to Win. You can't outperform your self-image, Dennis Connor. Life is a collection of self-fulfilling prophecies, John Nabor. Before the tournament began, few gave him a chance to contend, much less win. Jean Vandeveld was a 151 underdog, but to the amazement of the golf world and Scottish bookmarkers, there he was on Sunday, standing on the tee of the 72nd hole at Carnoustie, leading the 1999 British Open by three shots. One hole to go. All Van de Velde had to do was make six at number 18, a double bogey, and golf's oldest prize was his. The soft voice of reason told the dashing Frenchman to do the smart thing, play conservatively. Hit a five iron off the tee, then another five iron, then a wedge to the green. Two putts later, and Vanderbilt could kiss his wife and lift the claret jug of celebration as the first Frenchman to win a major golf championship in 92 years. But Vanderbilt didn't play it safe. In the gathering gloom, a light rain falling, he hit his driver. The ball sailed widely offline. Instead of wedging his next shot back onto the fairway, Vanderbilt took a full swing with a two iron. The ball bounced off the grandstand and disappeared into the rough. His next shot was from a terrible lie and landed in the winding creek that fronts the green. The world cringed as it watched him single-handedly turn the open into a stage play as compelling and wrenching as less miserable less miserabilis. Vandeville didn't make six. He made seven and then lost in a playoff. When the nightmare was over, witnesses asked the same head-shaking question. John, why didn't you play it safe? Why hit a two iron? The runner-up gave a little shrug. Next time I hit Z-Wedge, Vandeville said, pasting on, pasting on a brave smile. You'll say I'm a coward. But I'll hit Z Wedge. Why didn't he? Because that's not the way Vandeveld saw himself. Even though a timid shot might have assured him victory, he played the hole boldly and fearlessly. He had to play it that way, his wife Brigitte said. He played that way all week. Vandeveld was being true to his self image. The golfer's collapse made one Scottish bookmarker look like a prophet. The lead doesn't matter, he said. Before Vandeveld final round, the bookie tapped the side of his head with a finger. The gesture seemed to suggest he had little faith the leader would hold up under the pressure. Vandeveld, who had only one only tur who had won only one tournament on the European tour, was out of his comfort zone. Three is a psychological principle called cognitive dissonance. Let me backtrack. There is a psychological principle called cognitive dissonance. It can be defined as the uncomfortable psychological state that arises when how you see yourself and what is really happening come into conflict. Many athletes who experience this conflict revert to their comfort zone. We all have an interior comfort zone that we want to be in, said Dennis Connor, the American Cup skipper. Picture a good club golfer playing Jack Nicholas. His self-image is probably that he is a good golfer, but not good enough to beat Nicholas. If you beat Nicholas, he'll be uncomfortable with the demands of his new self-image. So, he does whatever he can to get back in the comfort zone, even if it means missing a two-foot putt on the 18th green. Annika Sornstam is a case in point. In an interview, the LPGA champion said that early in her career, she was afraid of having to speak in public and felt so uncomfortable being the center of attention, that she would deliberately miss putts on the later holes in tournaments just so she could finish second. She had a fear of success, 
which is a fear of failure at the next level. I love golf. I learned to play when I moved to Arizona. One day, I was at my home course on the 11th or 12th hole and made, and when a partner told me, Gary, you know you're shooting even par. I'm a 10 handicapper. My image of myself is not that of a par golfer. As soon as I heard the words, you're shooting par, I felt such a pressure on myself that I pushed my next tee shot out of bounds. Triple bogey. After that, I relaxed again. I was back in my comfort zone. There are a lot of comfort zone athletes. I see many of them in AAA baseball. During the last off season, I worked with a pitcher who has one of the liveliest arms in the game. In AAA, he is a dominating force, but every time he is placed in a major league situation, he falls apart. He can't see himself getting major leaguers out. <clears throat> the Arizona Cardinals once drafted a wonderfully gifted running back. He was as big and strong as any back in the NFL, but he couldn't see himself as a starter. He couldn't even imagine himself being successful. His self-image wouldn't let him, therefore, he wasn't in professional football for long. Limits, limits begin where vision ends. You have to see yourself as a no-limits person. For years, breaking the four-minute mile was thought to be physically impossible. Then, in 1954, Roger Bannister ran the mile in three minutes, 59 seconds, and four milliseconds. Over the next two years, 50 other runners broke that barrier. Why? They had an image. In Bannister, they had a model for success. Dennis Eckersley saw himself as a starting pitcher. Only when he reinvented his self-image and saw himself as a closer did he become a premier reliever. Recently, retired Cubs announcer Stephen Stone Oops, Steve Stone, a former major league pitcher, talks about reprogramming your subconscious mind. It's like wiping a blackboard clean and starting over, Stone said. The spring before I won the CY Young Award, I had to sit down and convince myself that I was better than a .500 pitcher. Humans are the only species that get in the way of their own growth. The most important thing a parent can give a child is a positive self-image. People asked Spud Webb, who is 5'4", how in the world he thought he could play in the NBA. How did Jim Abbott expect to play baseball, much less pitch in the major leagues with one arm? How would he field the ball? Olympic gold medal winner Wilma Rudolph said she had to overcome a overcome a lot of fears and self-images to become a success. Her first challenge was to learn to walk without a leg brace. Most of the work I do is a stretch and not a shrink. I help athletes expand their comfort zone and encourage them to take risks. If you don't see yourself succeeding or you don't feel deserving, you will sabotage yourself. Be willing to take a risk. Remember, there is security in life. Oops. Remember, there is no security in life. There is only adventure. Chapter 7. The Fire Inside Each of us has a fire in our hearts for something. It's our goal in life to find it and keep it lit. Mary Lou Retton all I want out of life is that when I walk down the street, folks will say, there goes the greatest hitter who ever lived, Ted Williams. He remembers gazing into the night sky as a boy, long, long ago. Each time he saw a falling star, he made a wish. Please, he said, let me be the hitter I want to be. As he grew older, his love for hitting a baseball didn't fade as many childhood infatuations do. 
the art form became his focus, his passion, his singular goal. A man has to have goals for days, for a lifetime, he said, upon reflection. Mine was to have people say, there goes Ted Williams, the greatest hitter who ever lived. On July 13, 1999, Major League Baseball staged its annual Midsummer Classic at Fenway Park in Boston. It was a glorious evening, perfect for stargazing. As part of the pre-game festivities, the National and American League All-Star teams were introduced to the sellout crowd. So were the legends of the game. One by one, the announcer presented the members of baseball's all-century team. Near the end of the roll call, a golf cart appeared in the old ballpark, along with millions of other TV viewers. I watched as it slowly paraded around the field, its heroic passenger smiling, waving, greeting with warm cheers. Cameras flashed like winking stars. And when the announcer welcomed him and honored him, his voice was close to reverence. That's Ted Williams, the greatest hitter who ever lived. Motivation is a popular word, especially in sports. It comes from a Latin word meaning to move. Athletes can move in one of two ways, either toward seeking pleasure, rewards, or toward avoiding pain punishment. Motivation can be the desire to succeed or the fear of failure. I believe the best and healthiest motivation is the one that pushed Ted Williams, the last major leaguer to hit over .400 in one season, to reach his goal and live his dream. An athlete's success is said to depend upon four factors physical ability, physical training, mental training, and desire or drive. The desire to succeed needs to be stronger than the fear of failure. You hear a lot of athletes who say they are motivated by a fear of failure. Pitcher David Cohn said, I couldn't disagree more. To me, it's an opportunity. This is what we live and play for. There's no place I'd rather be than right here, right now, pitching big games down the stretch for the Yankees. Muhammad Ali illustrates one of my favorite stories about motivation. (laughs) When he was growing up in Louisville, he got a job sacking groceries. He didn't make much money, but he saved enough to buy a second-hand bicycle. He loved that blue bicycle. He was very proud of it. He had worked hard for it and earned it. One day, someone stole his bike. He was heartbroken. I walked all over Louisville that summer looking for that bicycle, Ali said, picking up the narrative. I walked and looked, looked and walked. Never found it to this day. But every time I got into that ring, I looked across the other fighter and I told myself, hey, That's the guy who stole my bicycle. Athletes find motivation in different ways. Roger Clemens said he thrived on doubts that others had of him. The pitcher went into the 1997 season intent on proving the Red Sox had made a mistake by letting him go. The most successful athletes are self-motivated. The most important thing is to love your sport, said Peggy Fleming the former Olympic figure skating champion. Never do it to please someone else. It has to be yours. That is all that will justify the hard work needed to achieve success. At a workshop with elite teenager athletes, teenage athletes, I asked one man to relate his most enjoyable sports experience. He recalled being 10 or 11 years old. He talked about how much fun he had shooting hoops. As the teen relived the memory, his father's eyes welled with tears. The young man who wanted to quit his high school team was still playing basketball for his father's sake. 
It was his dad's dream, not his own. What we associate with pleasure, we pursue. What we associate with pain, we avoid. Playing sports as a kid should be enjoyable, positive, and rewarding experience. But too often, impressionable youngsters are embarrassed by a coach or they worry about pleasing their parents. Practicing in sports then becomes a painful, even punishing experience. As a coach, I would want my kids to have fun. I would want them to be eager and excited. I would want them to feel that they are improving and focusing on the process rather than the outcome. Motivation gets you moving in a direction. Being on a mission provides the emotion. Clemens was on a mission after he left the Red Sox. Arnold Schwarzenegger also had a mission. His vision created what he calls want power. Schwarzenegger said, me wanting to be Mr. Universe came about because I saw myself so clearly being up there on the stage and winning. Carl Lewis had an ambitious mission and a powerful vision too. I want to be remembered as a person who felt there was no limitation to what the human body and mind can do. And be the inspiration to lead people and do things they never hoped to do. At spring training, Alex Rodriguez designed t-shirts for himself and the Seattle Mar uh, Mariners teammates. The printed message read, we're on a mission, sir. How about you? Does a fire burn inside you? Do you have a mission? What is it? What motivates you? If it is a fear of failure, let the emotions go. The best motivation is want power that prideful desire to achieve. Chapter eight, the four Ds. Motivation gets you going. Discipline keeps you going. Jim Ryan. The only discipline that lasts is self-discipline. Bum Phillips. It's a bum name. Several years ago, a Phoenix area school district conducted a survey of its high school athletes. The results confirmed growing rumors and suspicions. Of the students at three high schools who responded to the survey, more than 20% said they knew teammates or other athletes who were using steroids. The Paradise Valley District took quick action, believing schools have an obligation to safeguard against the dangers of drugs. The district instituted random drug testing of its high school athletes. The program made national news and sparked a lively debate. Some people outside the district told administrators that drug testing might put district athletes at a competitive disadvantage. They think because other schools use steroids, our athletes won't be able to compete without using them too, said Toby. Spessard, a district administrator. That logic is strange to say the least. If our athletes have healthy minds and bodies and know they're going to compete fairly, I think that's an enormous advantage for us. At the time, I was team counselor for the NFL Cardinals. The school district asked if I would sit on a committee and develop a program to educate coaches and athletes about drugs and offer strategies to improve performance without the use of drugs, especially steroids. A sport medicine physician with the U.S. Olympic Committee conducted a study in which he asked young athletes this question. If a drug existed that would help you win an Olympic gold medal, but using it would take five years off your life, would you take it? More than half answered yes. Learning how to use one's mind can be as potent as any performance enhancing drug. 
in medical studies, many patients report improvement in their physical condition after they are given placebos or sugar pills. Why? The power of the mind. So true. I developed a mental skills training program for drug-free athletes called The Naturals. The night I outlined the program at a meeting with hundreds of high school athletes and their parents, I brought along two Cardinal players, Garth Jacks and Ron Wolfie. Someone said that people who have a fear, who have no fear, either are in mental institutions or on special teams. Wolfie played on special teams for the Cardinals. He made all pro running kamikaze missions, bolting downfield on punts and kickoffs, crashing full speed into oncoming opponents at great risk to his health and safety. As a player, he was fearless and tough and the most quotable player in the locker room. When I introduced Wolfie to the crowd, his message carried the same energy and passion with which he played the game. Ron spoke of a former NFL player he knew who took steroids and had become gravely ill. I've seen steroids, and I'm telling you, I don't use any of that stuff, Wolfie proclaimed. The only drug I use are the four Ds, and he ticked them off, one by one, raising his voice, whip cracking over the silent auditorium. Desire, dedication, determination, discipline. Those are the drugs I use. I don't have to buy them on the street corner. They don't cost me anything. He pointed to his chest, to his heart. I've got them right here. Desire. We talked at great length about desire in the last section. Want power is as important as willpower when it comes to accomplishing your goals. What's your wish? What do you long for? Ted Williams found his singular desire at an early age. What's your dream? How badly do you want it? Dedication. Dedication is turning desire into action, which requires lasting commitment. Football coach Lou Holtz said, if you don't make a total commitment to whatever you are doing, then you are starting. Then you start looking to bail out the first time the boat starts sinking. Randy Johnson, the most dominating power pitcher of our time, says the most tragic event in his life, his father died on Christmas Day, 1992, proved to be the turning point of his career. That was the year my heart became a lot bigger, Johnson said. It's a matter of maturity, and it's a matter of my heart getting bigger, and it's a matter of dedicating myself to be the best. Determination. Everyone wants to be successful, but those who achieve success are steeled by an unwavering resolve. They are self-motivated, the kind of motivation that fueled and sustained Jack Nicholas early in his pro career as he beat golf balls for an hour, then another on the practice range until it was almost dark. Let's go, Jack, his new wife, Barbara, called out impatiently. I'm hungry. With calloused hands, Nicholas hit another ball, then another, then another into the dying light. So am I, Jack replied. Discipline. It means doing what you have to do when you need to do it, whether you want to or not. Self-discipline, the only kind that lasts, is action-oriented. It doesn't procrastinate, and it doesn't make excuses. Setting a goal is not the main thing, said Tom Landry, the former Dallas Cowboys coach who is enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. It's deciding 
how you will go about achieving it and staying with that plan. The key is discipline.